So I'm going to get us started. I'm going to get us started. So welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. This is a terrific turnout. I'm excited by that. Um, as many of you probably know, I'm Andy Horowitz. I'm the uh, assistant dean for experiential education uh, here at the law school, which means in addition to my day job of teaching the criminal defense clinic, I also have oversight responsibilities for all of our experiential education programs, and the ones we're going to be talking about today are our clinics and our externship programs. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of what may feel like speed talking, because the, the very nice thing to be able to report is over the trajectory of our history at the law school, we have continued to build and develop experiential education programs so that we now have a very full and robust menu of these programs. So covering it in an hour is a little bit of a challenge. And what I'll say before I get going is, I assume what all of my colleagues who teach and direct these programs will also tell you, really your best source of information for most, if not all, of these programs is to talk to students who are presently in them or have been in them in the past because they can obviously provide a very different perspective than those of us who teach and run the programs can. Um, okay, so let me start here with what's the difference when I use the word clinic, when I use the word externship, which we call clinical externships to add to the confusion, uh, and then we have this third category. So boiled down to its essence, a thing we call a clinic, an in-house clinic, is where the attorney of record in the cases that that clinic or program are handling, the attorney of record is a full-time member of our faculty, right? So in my criminal defense clinic, I am the attorney of record on all of our cases. You <laughs> folks, those who are enrolled, are student attorneys and you work on these cases under my supervision. But that model creates the ability for me and those of us who teach in the in-house clinic to give you a tremendous amount of personal individual responsibility for each of these cases because this is the only job we have to shepherd you and those cases. Right? Um, an externship in some contrast uh, is where you go out to some existing office. It can be a judge's chambers, it can be a corporate counsel office, it can be any of a whole wide array of public interest or governmental offices. Um, and your supervisor on the cases is a lawyer who's employed by that entity. Right? They're not a faculty member here at the law school, uh, and you work with them in that capacity. Uh, and then a component of all of those programs is a two-credit seminar that's taught by a member of our faculty uh, who sort of puts coherence around that experience and is in constant contact with the field supervisors and making sure that what's happening at the placement site is educationally sound, consistent with your educational goals, etc. Um, so, uh, right, a clinic has a faculty supervisor, real clients, externships, you go to a field site, your supervisor is an attorney or a judge, although judges are of course also attorneys, and there are likewise real clients in real cases. This third category, we run a program called the Veterans Disability Field Clinic. It's a bit of a hybrid between a clinic and an externship because the attorney of record is an adjunct member of our faculty. You'll meet her shortly. Where is she? There she is. So when it's her turn, she'll get up and tell you a little bit more. Um, but she works at a law firm and the program is located essentially within the confines of a law firm. So it's a little bit of a mix uh, of the two experiences. Okay, so commitment. In our in-house clinics, we generally expect on average, although this is really an average because when you're doing real cases, work fluctuates. On average, 20 hours a week, you get eight graded credits for it. Um, those clinics meet as classes for four hours a week, but that's all rolled into the eight credits. Uh, an externship program, you design your own with the externship director about how many days a week, and you can work two, three, four, or five days a week. If you're working five days a week full time, we call that a semester in practice. Um, those field credits, the credits you're getting for working in the field under the supervision of some attorney or judge who's not one of our employees, are ungraded credits. 
But the seminar component that's taught by a member of our faculty is a graded seminar for two credits. Uh, again, the field clinic is sort of a, a hybrid. Uh, you're expected to devote 15 hours a week for six graded credits. And like the in-house clinics, you get one unified grade. We don't differentiate grading the, the sort of casework and the work in the classroom component. Okay, so I mentioned semester in practice. This is a relatively new experience that the faculty adopted here, um, where uh, we are prepared with permission, so everybody who does an externship in practice needs to meet with me and talk through their educational plan, and the sooner the better, because it has implications on other classes you're going to register for and how you're going to map out satisfying all your graduation requirements. But with permission, you can, in any of the externship programs we're going to talk about today, do it as a semester in practice, where that is the only thing you're doing that semester. We make the field work and the seminar that goes along with it. We make one exception in terms of what we allow you to take on top of that, and that is the ALR class, which is our bar prep class. Um, we figure out how to do that remotely for people who are doing a semester in practice, remotely, because since you're working in this environment full time, you don't need to be located here in Rhode Island if you've got an externship somewhere else in this country, or in fact, we've done some international ones, and you sort of Skype in, it's not literally Skype, but you participate remotely in the seminar component of the, of the class. Um, we have two specialized programs that are semester in practice. One is a program we run in Washington, D.C. every spring, we have a former full-time tenured faculty member who uh, left his faculty position, works in the government now in Washington, D.C., uh, but the law school employs him to direct a program where people who are working in externships full-time in Washington, D.C. have their own specialized program and their own specialized class taught by Professor Zlotnick. The other one is the New York Pro Bono Scholars Program. That's a program that is essentially run by the, in a certain way, run by the New York State Bar. Um, what that program entails is that you can actually take the bar exam. It would be the New York bar exam, but the New York bar exam is UBE, Uniform Bar Exam. So that applies to lots of other states, including, moving forward now, Rhode Island. Uh, you take that bar exam in February of your third year, and then in March through June of your third year, you're in a full-time public interest externship program. You graduate, literally you walk in May with your classmates, but you literally graduate in June when you completed all of the requirements. And you can then immediately, if the bar has gone successfully, begin to practice law. So that's a very appealing program for a variety of folks. The externship connected to that is it has to be a public interest externship and likewise this is something that if you're even remotely interested in you ought to be talking to me as soon as you can because it requires a great deal of advanced planning okay so credit options you can take these programs in combination right so you can take a clinic and an externship even if that externship is a semester in practice you can take two clinics. You can take two externships within limits. You can't do two semesters in practice because there is a cap on the number of clinical credits you can earn. So the credit counting is a little bit complicated, not, I think, worth trying to sort out collectively today. But the point is, think about the fact that you can have multiples of these experiences and talk to us to get counseling to begin to plan whatever experiences you may want to have. Um, this word advanced speaks to the fact that you can come back to a program that you already did once if the director thinks that it will continue to be a valuable educational experience for you uh, in a somewhat more limited setting in terms of the number of credits you can earn. Okay, so this is our roster for clinics. We have the Business Startup Clinic, Criminal Defense and Immigration Clinic. We're each going to talk a little bit about our, our individual programs, the Veterans Disability Field Clinic. Uh, and then I'm not going to read the list, but this is the list of externships uh, that you're going to hear about. 
Okay, so we are going to talk now individually about these programs, and first I'm going to ask uh, Professor Ahern to talk about her program. Wow. <laughs> I can count on Tony. Okay. I just want to send today my secret seat from law school, so uh -oh. I'll have it to that hard. Uh, so I'm Kate Ahern, I run the Business Startup Clinic which is a transactional program, meaning we are not in court, we are not doing litigation, a little bit different than the other clinics you are about to hear about. So uh, we serve small businesses, entrepreneurs, and some nonprofits as well who are just getting started. So let me give you a snapshot of where we are right now. So the students have just been through most of their ramp up in the first few weeks, so they've done a class on nonprofits and business organizations, and they've done interviewing simulations, counseling simulations, they had an intellectual property class. They're about to have a class with our intellectual property supervisor who's out in the community. I'll tell you about that in a moment, and he's going to teach them how to do trademark searches. They're about to interview their clients that are their responsibility. Everyone has their own clients. Uh, for the first time, they will meet uh, their clients, and soon they'll be working on things like advising on intellectual property strategy. So do you need a trade secret? Do you need a trademark? Do you need a copyright? How does all that fit together? We do not do patents. We don't have enough science and engineering brains for that at the moment. Um, there, we're going to be writing contracts and forming businesses and uh, advising entities on how to get started. We're, I expect we're going to start at least a few new nonprofit organizations this semester and put them out into the world. And uh, they will also be out in the community doing presentations. So there are organizations in Rhode Island that also support entrepreneurs, and we go out into the community to give presentations on uh, similar topics. So the other thing to know is that we are part of the intellectual, the USPTO, US Patent and Trademark Office, uh, Intellectual Property Clinic Program. So that means our <coughs> clinic is part of this program, and our students get to do intellectual property work, and in essence, practice before the USPTO. As part of that, we have an external supervisor as well that we work with who helps on our more sophisticated trademark matters as well. And the last thing to know is that there is a prerequisite, prerequisite for this course, which you will see you do need to take the business organizations class <coughs> before. So like many of these clinics, there's a lot of planning involved um, as early on as possible. And I will be around afterwards if anyone has any questions. And you can also find me by email. Thank you. Good work, Tony. You're a leader. You're a leader. Okay, so uh, I'm up next in the roster. So I direct the Criminal Defense Clinic. So the Criminal Defense Clinic functions essentially like a mini public defender's office. I'll take as many as 10 students each semester. Those students will, after a ramp up period at the beginning where we do a lot of training and simulation, uh, get their own caseload. Uh, on average, students in the Criminal Defense Clinic will handle five or six clients over the course of the semester. What we're handling are predominantly misdemeanor criminal cases. So all of our clients are people who are indigent, can't afford to hire their own lawyer, would otherwise generally be uh, sent to the public defender's office or to a court-appointed counsel, but instead uh, come in our direction. And the student is individually responsible for his or her clients. Uh, the design of the program is that I have very little direct interaction with the client um, because part of the purpose is for you to be establishing an attorney-client relationship with the client and for the client to look to you as the lawyer, not to me as the lawyer. This is sort of the beauty of the, the luxury we have in a clinic where I have the ability to handle these cases th this way in a way that a public defender with a full caseload really can't. There are incredibly valuable reasons to do an externship with a public defender's office if you're interested in that field. These are very different experiences. What I generally encourage for people who are interested in this work specifically is to try to do both because I think there's a lot of value in both experiences. What you're getting in the clinic is a very small exposure to very few cases, but you're working those cases hard and individually. You do the interview. You investigate the case. You counsel the client. You negotiate with the prosecutor. If the case winds up being tried, which sadly very few of our cases do, mostly if we have really interesting or viable defenses, the prosecution relents and dismisses the case. So um, the his reality across the country is very few misdemeanors get tried. That's true in here in Rhode Island. So if you're desperately looking for a trial experience, this is the wrong program for you. If what you're looking for is an experience with working closely with clients, 
and building cases up through the trial preparation stage and thinking through the strategies and playing all that out in a negotiation context and appearing in court, this is the program for you because that's what we do. Uh, about a third of our caseload generally are crimes of domestic violence. Of course, we're representing a person accused of being violent in a domestic uh, setting. Um, we do sometimes represent uh, what we call complaining witnesses, people who are uh, alleged to be the victim of domestic violence, who sometimes are in need of counsel, and we'll do that too. Uh, we do a lot of representation of people on drunk driving cases. We do a lot of representation of people on breathalyzer or chemical test refusal cases that are, go along with the DUI. Those charges are civil in nature, so they take us over to the Rhode Island Traffic Tribunal. People do not have a right to appointed counsel on those cases, so we serve a particularly valuable function in the clinic in representing people uh, in that court. Um, we meet twice a week in class. Uh, you need to have, in order to make the schedule work so that court is not interfering with classes and vice versa, you need to schedule your semester where you have three days a week where you do not have class until late afternoon or evening. Because the clinic is eight credits, that's usually not particularly hard for students to do. Um, and there is a prerequisite. You need to have taken trial advocacy before you can be in the criminal defense <coughs> Okay, so I think I'll stop there, but uh, as Katie said, I think we'll all be around. Uh, we'll hopefully have some time for questions, uh, and you can always reach out to any one of us. Uh, so, yep, next. Debbie. Hello, I'm Debbie Gonzalez. I'm the director of the Immigration Clinic. My clinic runs very similar to Professor Horwitz's clinic in that we represent indigent clients who can't afford to pay an attorney in immigration proceedings. Um, we go to uh, immigration court in Boston. We also represent a lot of uh, children in family court and in probate court, as well as going to immigration in Johnston. So you're really uh, doing a lot of uh, court. This semester, for example, all of my students are having uh, at least one court experience, either going to Boston or the family court or probate court. Um, some of them are having two or three. Um, so I'm somewhere in between Katie and Andy in that my students already have their cases. They've had their cases for about a week. We really have no time for simulation in the immigration clinic. It's kind of a, here you go, and let's get going. Um, I am there. I am, you know, the safety net for all of the students. So it's not like you're all just kind of, you know, swimming uh, without your swimmies on. I'm, I'm definitely there. The swimmies, the swimmies yeah. Um, we have a substantive class component, so immigration isn't a prerequisite. I give you all of that. It's uh, top-heavy in the sense that the beginning of the semester is a lot of immigration law. It's learning your case. It's meeting with your client. It's interviewing the client, preparing for trial. You're doing all of the things a lawyer does in an immigration case. So interviewing and counseling, uh, developing the theory of your case. In some instances, the theory may have already been developed by the student before you because these cases go on for years and years. But every student towards the mid of the semester will get one new consultation that they'll do um, with a new client wherein as a class we decide whether or not we're taking that case um, or not. So everybody will have the opportunity to meet with the client um, to, to make that assessment. If you don't, we also do community service work, which requires, I require every student to sign up for at least one time where we're going to Progressive Latino, we partner up with them. And we do individual consultations to members of the community. These, we do do a, a simulation for the consultations, but personally I have no idea what the consultations are gonna look like because it's, these are people just showing in the door um, looking for some advice and that's what we're there to do. Um, this semester I'm super excited because we finally got an agreement with the Rhode Island PD's office where we'll be doing consultations with the public defender. So in Rhode Island, the public defender's office does not have an attorney who does immigration work. And so we have now become kind of their immigration attorney. Not in that we're gonna represent people, but in that we will be able to advise the uh, public defender what the best course of action is going to be um, on the case. Um, so I've talked about the substantive class, real, cl real client representation. Um, and community service. Um, 
I think I'm going to leave it there. I unfortunately have to go because I have class in Providence at 2, but you can email me. It's dgonzalez at rwu.edu. Um, if not, I'm sure Lori or, or Lisa or somebody can um, get you in touch with me. Hi everyone, my name yeah. is Dana Wiener. I'm going to talk from here because it's really difficult to get out of these chairs. It's actually good. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I teach the Veterans Disability Field Clinic. We are based um, at the law firm of Chisholm, Chisholm and Kilpatrick in downtown Providence. And we uh, are an appellate law firm, so it's a little bit unique. And we represent clients from all over the country. Uh, with regard to their veterans disability appeals so when um, veterans are denied their disability benefits we work on the appeal to try and get those denials reversed and so the clinic is really unique because um, students come in from the beginning we assign them a case um, so they work on uh, a real case of a real client from the firm they spend the first few weeks uh, getting to know the client getting to know the file um, so within, let's say, two weeks, they know pretty much everything about this person and the years of struggle that they've gone trying to get their benefits. Um, and the first half of the semester, we work on general case law um, about veterans' disabilities, some deference stuff, some um, admin law, um, and we work on a memorandum of law um, that they'll actually present to VA, to their Office of General Counsel. VA will look at it, and then the, um, the clinic student will participate in a settlement conference with VA to see if we can get this client's case settled. Um, and that's something that I'll supervise, but that we, but the clinic student actually um, sort of takes the lead on, and I really don't do anything except sit in and listen. The second half of the semester will be um, more of the oral advocacy part of appellate work, and so the student will work on a oral argument. Um, and the final is a mock oral argument where the judges are other attorneys at the firm. Um, so that's always a lot of fun. And so it's a really nice way to get some experience with um, appellate work if that's something you're interested in. And so our goals are really twofold to get um, the veterans experience, um, have some real clients, get the law firm experience, and then also just, you know, the basic skills of what it's like to work in a law firm to um, gain those oral skills, those oral advocacy skills, the writing skills, and just the basic learning skills. So um, I'm around if you have any questions, of course, after, and um, by email as well. I'm located in Providence, um, so I'm not here on campus, but um, I'm available by email. Um, anytime. Thanks. OK, we're going to shift gears now to start talking about our clinical externship programs. And Laura, I'll I get the steering wheel. Absolutely. Mail. Um, so, so just reiterating so everything that you've heard about you're directly supervised by a faculty member in the externship program we send you out there you're supervised by a lawyer or judge in the field but we keep you tethered to the law school through a seminar that meets once a week so so just generally in the externship program when you apply and you submit a resume um, uh, sometimes we'll have you submit a writing sample or a cover letter your materials are very important because those are the materials that we're going to send to the office so so you should work hard on those materials before you submit them because they're the ones that will be going out um, inter, um, so basically you you'll apply to the program will accept you to the program and then each director will meet with you individually to figure out where we're going to place you and we make those placements so you'll come to us we'll talk through with you the various options and then we'll decide where we're sending your materials and we'll always send them to one place that you agree on and then you'll interview and the placement has the right of, you know, they can take you or refuse you. If they, if they don't want you, we'll find you another place. No one, almost hardly ever, anybody, does anybody get turned down by the one place that we send them to. Um, so um, our seminars are all different. Some of them are sub, sort of substantive and doctrinal in the, sub, in the substantive area. Some of them are more general. For instance, the public interest seminar that I teach because you're all di doing different kinds of law. Um, okay, everything is offered, um, most things are offered in the fall and the spring. New York Pro Bono Scholars and the DC Semester in Practice Program are only offered in the spring, as is the environmental and land use is only in the spring. We also offer two programs in the summer, so corporate counsel and public interest, and public interest also includes prosecution, okay? But I'll go through this in a little more detail. 
But um, we're going to come up one by one. I think that David Gibbs is next. Hi, I'm David Gibbs. Uh, I run the uh, Corporate Council program. Um, basically, uh, we're the a flip side of uh, Katie Hearn's program. She's her her students are working with people with you know problems who are ventures. Uh, the corporate council we're basically working with very large companies that are national and global, and you're working in an in-house office. So I'm not your supervisor. And one of the most interesting things about that is. You have an attorney-client relationship with the company with which you're working. I'm not their attorney. So confidentiality is very important. I can help you. Your fellow students can help you. But it has to be at a level where the client's confidentiality is always preserved because we're not their attorneys. Um, and so you'll work with these in-house lawyers. Uh, do I do this? Uh, next? Hey. Okay, so these are some. Tell clap for them. <laughs> Probability says you can't be wrong all the time. These are some of the companies uh, we work with. Uh, not every company, not every semester. Uh, uh, we do it a little differently. We send your resume typically to three companies. And we, but we meet, we find out what you're most interested in, and you know we try to do matching, and then you interview. And as uh, Lori Barron said, uh, we've never had a problem placing people. Uh, and people uh, typically get their first choice, and we give the companies their first choice. So people are uh, generally enthused. What type of things do people do? They do things that relate to their company. So. Uh, uh, we have someone who does a semester in practice at the Red Sox this semester, and she's working on a sweepstakes issue where they're giving away a benefit, but not to everybody. Uh, we had people who were working on cross-border problems where uh, Canada and the U.S. have different employment policies, and you know, what does the company do? And so some of the problems relate to the nature of the company. Swarovski, we haven't had too many jewelry problems, but they make a lot of other things. Uh, and some of it's just whatever the cat drags in, whatever problem the company has, they come. And these are some of our companies. Uh, we do semester in practice. The Red Sox is a semester in practice. Uh, we had somebody at uh, Nestle's in New Jersey last uh, spring. Uh, and that you need to plan ahead. Uh, what areas do we work on? I think I kind of covered that. Uh, basically everything. Uh, 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 I can't tell you what you're going to do. Uh, we sent someone to uh, Moran Shipping who was interested in maritime law. They had a hurricane last year that flattened their offices and they were doing all this landlord tenant with force majeure because that was the problem the company had. Um, three, four, five days a week. It's like everyone else. I do want to make a pitch for business. Most of you will have four to six careers in your legal career. More lawyers do business than any other area of the law. And so uh, you're at a school that has great programs. And I would recommend, you know, public interest, a clinic, an externship, Take full advantage and take two. So if you have questions, uh, call me, see me, I'll be around. Thanks, David. Yep. You're going to need to grab and yep. push your button. I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next button. She has button a little more I say that. Oh, there, there we go. All right, now yeah, I just have yeah. one. <laughs> um, so I'm Julia Wyman. Um, I direct the Marine Affairs Institute, as many of you know me from. But here, I also direct the um, Environmental and Externship Program. Um, so for those of you that think of me as Marine Affairs, we do all ocean and coastal. The Environmental and Land Use Externship Program is to really look at some of the broader environmental issues that are facing us and some land use issues. Um, like all of the other programs, you can do um, two, three, four, five days in your placement. Um, for this um, 
externship, we have four placements, and they're very different. So we have the Conservation Law Foundation, which is here in Providence, um, the Providence City Solicitor's Office, uh, the AG's Environmental Unit, and the Department of Environmental Management here in Rhode Island. All of the issues that potentially could come across your plate in those offices are very different and depend on the semester. So if you're interested in the externship program, um, right before you apply, you can come meet with me and we can talk about some of the cases that may be brought in some of those different placements during your time there. Um, important things to note, so um, a lot of these placements do have heavy litigation, so if you're interested in being an environmental litigator, this is a, a good place for you to explore that. Um, Depending on the placement and depending on where they're at in terms of litigation, you may get the opportunity to really spend some time in court or you may um, be doing more discovery and background research for them. Um, we do offer this program only in the spring, so that's definitely something to think about, especially those of you that are 2Ls in the room. Um, if you are thinking about doing a joint degree program, not just the Marine Affairs joint degree program, but any joint degree program here, you're going to want to think heavily about, and, and you're considering this program, you want to think strongly about doing it during your second year of law school because it may be a little bit easier to balance with um, a hectic schedule in your third year. Um, some of the issues you might come across in this externship, clean water <laughs> issues, energy issues, oil and gas issues, um, zoning regulations, where should we put this building? Should we allow these people to build this building? Um, air quality issues really runs the gamut. Um, we do have a prerequisite for this. Um, environmental law, natural resources, ocean and coastal law, or land use. If you're really interested in the program and you haven't taken any of those courses, um, I'm willing to make exceptions, but you need to sort of make an argument to me on that. Um, during the seminar, we also don't necessarily have um, access to your attorney-client privilege in your placement. Um, we're going to focus a lot on environmental and administrative law issues in general, so we'll be doing a little bit of one-on-one -on, -one on those. Um, and then also talking about sort of how the environmental and land use field functions um, and the kinds of issues that, that will regularly come up in the field. I think that that's it. Um, I will also be around, so happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Okay, so I'm going to talk next about um, the Judicial Externship Program, which is taught by Dean Yelnoski. Um, I taught it for many years, so I am comfortable talking about it. Um, so this is the program that, um, that many 2Ls will want to do in the spring of their 2L year. Okay, and just by a show of hands, how many of you are 2Ls in here? And we have and we have some three L's. So right. So so this fall, three L's are applying only for the right right now. This application period is only for the spring. Okay. So um, and then in the spring, two L's will be applying for all of next year. So you'll be applying for the fall and the spring of next year. So there are slots open for three L's in the spring in not every program, but many of them. But the judicial externship program is one that is really um, heavily populated by spring 2Ls. So we have placements with all of the judges in Rhode Island at all levels of courts. So we have students with Judge Thompson and Judge Salia, who are the First Circuit Court of Appeals, which is, you know, like as, as good as it gets unless you're at the, Rhode, at the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, and those students will, will go to Boston to hear oral, oral arguments, although the offices are located here. We have students in federal district court with federal magistrates, Rhode Island Supreme Court, Superior Court, Bankruptcy Court, um, and even Immigration Court. So, um, so this really is great for students who think they might want to clerk after they graduate, because you'll see what it's like to work in judicial chambers, to write opinions, to sit still for that long, right? See if that's something that appeals to you. It's also great for students who don't want to clerk, but they want the experience, right? You want, it, you want to work on your research and writing, you want to know how judges think, but you think you don't want to clerk. So, so this is great for 2Ls. Um, it is the real world, and judges care about things like grades and law review and your writing, but not all of the judges care about those things. So you don't select yourself out, because we have many judges who say, I don't want the kids at the top of the class. I want to work with somebody who might never clerk and, and try to bring them along, and other judges are like, give me the top 10, and that's all I want. So don't, don't select yourself out. Um, 
This seminar is taught by um, Justice Flaherty, who's on the Rhode Island Supreme Court, and Chief Judge Will Smith, who's the Chief Judge of the Federal District Court. So it is, it is not, you took this class, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, so they're a, they're a, they're a bit of a comedy team. Right. Yeah, exactly. So they, they are lively and fun, and it really is a great chance to be in a room with 10 to 15 students and have complete access to these judges. Um, it's a great experience. The judges that you work with will treat you like one of their clerks. They'll give you, you know, the materials for a case and say, you tell me how you think this should come out, and you write the opinion. They might not follow, the, you know, they might not do what you said they should do, but they'll at least give you that opportunity. So this is a great program that students should take advantage of. Next program is the one that I teach in the fall and the spring, and Susie Harrington Stephan teaches this in the summer. And this is, um, this is the public interest externship. And I have students all over doing all different kinds of things. We have merged the prosecution placements into this um, program for this year. We've had a, so just so that you know, there are public defender placements, civil legal services placements, prosecution placements. The sky's the limit. Obviously, our seminar can't focus on doctrine and substance because you're all doing completely different things. But I have a lot of students who do a semester of practice and go other places and zoom into class. So this semester I have somebody, um, these are two 3Ls, we're both graduating in December. I've got somebody doing innocence work in Florida, just literally moved down there, doesn't know anybody, and he's got a case that's his, and it's his job to convince the lawyers in the office that they should take this case, um, either that there's newly discovered evidence um, um, or some constitutional issue that happened below. Um, we've got a student in Mississippi who's doing death penalty cases, and he missed class one night because he literally had to travel like 10 hours to meet with a client on death row. Um, really heavy stuff. And I've got a student who's in um, Suffolk County, New York, as a district attorney, and she's on her feet every day. She's got a student practice rule. And it's a place that she'd like to work when she gets out of here. And so, so they zoom into the class, and then I have a bunch of kids who are here locally. Um, so um, really, the sky's the limit for what you want to do. I love working with students to find new placements. And since our semester of practice program started maybe three, four years ago, uh, my favorite thing is to sort of start meeting with you in the spring of your 2L year and figure out where you're going to go. So I've got a bunch of students who've had a bunch of interviews, and we're figuring it out for the spring, but we started last spring. Um, so, um, okay, so that's public interest, I think. Um, I'm yeah, trying to so back over to you. So, um, we're gonna, we have a video, yes. yes. Okay, so let me just give a very brief introduction and then he's gonna uh, magically appear by video. Uh, <laughs> so, as I said, he lives and works in D.C. He's actually a lawyer at, at FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, but what he does is assist students in finding placements in D.C., although a lot of that is also on the student to work collaboratively to find placements. But a, a whole host of placements, government, not-profit, non-for-profit, uh, trade organizations, um, and once you are enrolled in the program, you are living and working in D.C., and you're in a two-credit seminar that's taught physically in D.C. by Professor Zlotnick. So. Help me, Lisa. What do we need to do? Here? Hi, hi. This is Dave Lockwood. I am the coordinator of the DC Central Contract Flow Program, and I'm speaking to you from my office at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, where for the last five years I have been in the Office of Enforcement. Uh, before that, also, I was at Rockwood faculty for over 15 years. Uh, but the Lord DC, where I had started my career, brought me back, and I'm excited. Uh, to share this city and these experiences with Roger Williams students um, when they come down. The program is actually very unique in that it offers you the opportunity to work 40 hours a week full time for a government agency or a nonprofit kind of in Washington. And that gives our program a great advantage because so many other externship programs are just two or three days a week for local students. And so we've had a lot of success placing students in programs that they really want to be in. That's also because Washington, D.C. 
is just a mecca. Obviously, government is here, but so are all the public interest groups, nonprofits, and associations that work on national policy issues. You also have the opportunity to do a wide variety of work. If you're interested in impact litigation, if you're interested in research, if you're interested in advocacy, if you're interested in government regulation, there are huge opportunities um, to do different kinds of work. And I think that also makes this uh, program appealing. And we do have to work together to find you a good program, but rest assured, uh, I will always make the time for the students, um, whether it's later in the day or in the evening, to talk to you, whether it's before you come here or while you're here, uh, to help you have a great experience. Uh, the other things I wanted just to tell you a little bit about the course, um, in some respects it's similar to the other extrinsic courses um, run by the school in that we focus on the kinds of skills that students need to succeed in their externships, whether it's learning how to ask for and receive feedback, whether it's learning how to write for a professional setting and adapt your writing to the setting of the agency or group that you're in. But I also have focused the course on the kind of problem solving, which after all is what lawyers do in almost every context, to the DC setting. Uh, and I do that both work, through working with things that the students are working on and also by bringing in uh, many of the friends that I have here uh, who are mid or late career to talk about uh, particular issues or problems that they were faced with earlier in their career and the mix of sort of legal analysis, policy, and in fact just personal relationships and how they were able to work out um, difficult issues that they found at some point in their career. The last thing I would add is that DC is a very vibrant city. Uh, there are just in the last 10 or 15 years, uh, restaurants have bloomed, neighborhoods that were sort of no walk zones are now filled with cafes. There are lots of housing opportunities, particularly because the metro system is really great. You can live uh, cheaper in Virginia or Maryland if you want, or you can find a group house in DC. Uh, it's a very transient place, and so there are always opportunities uh, for folks to, to find housing for a couple of months. Um, I invite you to, uh, to call me separately at my office line here in Washington or write to me if you have some interest in the program. I'd be happy to set aside some time to see if uh, the interests you have match the program. And I look forward to speaking with many of you in the future. Uh, so once again, uh, it's very nice to meet you. Sorry I can't be there in person, uh, but I love the school and uh, I'm still close to the faculty and the staff there. And uh, I just really would like this program to really meet the needs of the school and the students. So uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks very much. That was actually better than when he's moving his yeah. <laughs> 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 All right. Okay. So what I'll say, in addition to what uh, Professor Zlotnick just said about that program and this program, we've been saying it about every program, but if you think about a semester in practice, it's particularly important to plan early, really early, right? So if you're interested in DC, you ought to be talking to him and to me basically now. Uh, and same thing with the New York Pro Bono Scholars Program. So. As I said earlier, well, I, what I didn't say is Eliza Vorenberg, who is in the Feinstein Center, is the teacher, the director of this program. Um, it runs in the spring semester from March to June, because in February of that semester, you're taking the bar exam, which it is administered in New York. You have to take it in New York, but it's uniform bar exam. Uh, and then you do 12 weeks of full-time and externship in a public interest setting at an approved placement. We will work with you to try and find placements. Because uh, there are uh, so many, uh, because this is run in New York, there are many, many offices in New York that are now set up to have people in this time frame working full time. But there is no requirement that you do it in New York. In fact, we've had students not do it in New York. We had one student do it in the Rhode Island Center for Justice. There's no requirement that you be in New York the only connection really to New York is it's the UBE in New York that you wind up taking in February and you get yourself admitted in New York, but you can then take that UBE result uh, elsewhere. Um, begin planning early uh, and you need to talk to me. I think that's about it yeah, in terms of that program. Um, okay, so, yes, David. 
I just have one comment, and uh, Katie can correct me. Okay. Uh, BizDorg is a very important prerequisite for our her clinic and my externship. Another course that's very important is contract drafting yes. and Good. transactions, Good. because that's what you do in either program. The Red Sox have told us, don't send us anybody who hasn't taken that. So you might want to think about that if you have an interest in the clinic or in the externship. And it's also something that lawyers do a lot. It's a great class. We offer it every semester. It really is quite foundational to anybody who thinks that at some point in their career, and I agree with what David said, that's probably many of you uh, will work in any kind of business or transactional sale. Okay, so uh, we have some time for questions and answers. Let me just say what you really ought to be doing, in addition to the questions you certainly can ask now, is reach out to the directors, reach out to the students. The Feinstein Center is really our hub of planning. Uh, those of you who know that you're really focused on business and transactional work, these are the folks you should be talking to about planning. Um, and uh, Lori mentioned this, but let me sort of highlight it. We do two application periods each year, one in the fall, one in the spring. The application period in the fall, the one that's coming now, is just for the spring that immediately follows. But really, really importantly, particularly to the two L's and one L's who are already starting to think, the application period in the spring is for the entirety of the following year, right? Because we want you to plan, we have a process that enables you to plan. So be processing that and let's uh, take questions if people have them. And let me just also add, so the deadline is October 8th. Um, we will let you know sometime around, like, around the 19th of October at the latest, so that you will know in time to register for classes and figure out the schedule and all of that. So, any questions? Yes? Can we access this uh, PowerPoint somehow? Hmm. Can yeah, we post I'll, it? I, I will send it to everyone. Great. Good question. I should also say there are evaluations in the Feinstein Center of anyone who's done an externship anywhere that's given us permission to have it, so for the public interest program and for the prosecution program and for um, several semesters in practice. So that can also be a good way to sort of get a sense of what people are doing in their externships. Yeah. It was a, a comment. Uh, there is maximum of 20 credits that can be used um, towards our JD mm -hmm. for uh, either clinic or externship or, or field practice. Um, so my question is, I don't know, let's see. Do we, um, can this, will this also meet some of the requirements that the uh, law school puts on us, for example, like skill credits? We need so many uh, courses for skill credits. The Did answer to that is yes. The field work credits and the clinic credits count toward that requirement. Perfect. Thank you. And we should add, we also have a, a cap. You can only do two semesters of experiential ed. Um, you're guaranteed one as long as you apply by the spring of your 2 well year. We encourage you to do two, and I think something like 75% of our students do two um, of these experiences. But you can't do three. Any other questions? Okay, so, um, you know, just to end by stressing that you ought to plan early and you ought to reach out to students and to those of us who've heard from you if you have further uh, issues you want to talk about. Thanks. Thanks for coming.